Good evening. Thank you all for coming, uh, despite of the snow and everything else that's happening. Uh, this is a very important moment for me personally because this is the first event of the Faris Center for Eastern Mediterranean Studies um, uh, at Fletcher. And it's a big challenge because if we're starting with Nikolai Mladenov as a speaker, it would be very difficult to, f to maintain the caliber in the, in, in the future. So I want to start by thanking him very much for coming all the way, especially for us. Uh, after being at the Security Council reporting on uh, his mission in, in, in Iraq. Um, you've all seen his, his um, biography, which has been cir circulated, so I won't go th through it in, in, in detail. But he, he is a man who has been given many impossible tasks before, and uh, he moves from one to a another, and his next one is going to be uh, as a special coordinator for the Middle East peace process in, 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 pa in Palestine. Um, he, wa he was um, Minister of Defense and, and Min Minister of Foreign Affairs in, in Bulgaria. For, and, and during his ministry, he really put Bulgaria on the, on the European map. We felt the difference in Brussels that th th suddenly there were very challenging and sometimes troublemaking uh, uh, motions in the council, and we wondered where it, they were coming from, and they came from from the Bulgarian de delegation. So uh, he's had he leaves an impact everywhere he goes, and I'm sure he will also leave an impact on our, on, on us uh, uh, in, in in the future. Um, and I'd like to give him an open invitation that when he's finished from solving the problems of Iraq, Palestine, Israel, the Balkans, Europe, Russia, Ukraine, and the world, uh, to please come back and st spend more time with us because this is going to be too short for us to make full take full advantage of, of, your, of, your, of your presence. So, and and uh, I'd also like to, to welcome his, his team uh, Mr. Miroslav uh, Zafirov, who, who was very kindly given a seminar this, this afternoon, and they're both participating in an informal coffee and conversation tomorrow, tomorrow morning. And, and also uh, Ms. Despina Sarayoglu, who comes here uh, to her own territory because she comes from the same region of as, as uh, Dean Stavridis, so she has sovereignty already in, <laughs> in, in. And I also would like to thank Professor Cecile Aptel for moderating the, 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 the discussion. You all know Professor Aptel, she's Associate Professor of International Law and specializing in international criminal law, so there are so many interesting questions of transitional justice that, that arise and the rights of women and children. There are, these are not marginal issues in, in a subject like Iraq. There's, there's big politics, but these are very important, especially when it comes to discussions of judicial reform and comparative perspectives from other, uh, other areas, even including the Balkans and, and Africa. And uh, so th thank you very much for this. And welcome to both of you, and I look forward to lecture. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Nadim. It is um, um, indeed an honor and a pleasure to see you here in your new capacity. Uh, um, we go back some time, um, not just uh, on Iraq, but on Syria and a number of other issues that we um, tried to s successfully or not so successfully deal with um, over the last few years. Um, it, I want to thank you and the Faris Center for this invitation. And I will reveal a secret. I'm very, uh, not just honored, but emotional to be here at, um, at Fletcher. I have a personal history with Fletcher, um, and that is that I never came to study here. <laughs> I really wanted to do that. 
Um, and I looked at the prospectus many, many years ago when I had uh, finished my bachelor degree back in Sofia, uh, but I could never get the scholarship to come here. So you're all very lucky uh, to be here, and I wish you all very uh, great success um, uh, because it is indeed a great school with very good tradition um, and um, impact uh, not just at the United Nations but on many international um, fora. Failing to uh, come to Fletcher, uh, I got the scholarship to go to King's College in London. Um, and uh, it was a very good, actually, opportunity for me because had I come here, I would have probably learned a lot about the Congress of Vienna. Um, going to King's, I learned about all the things that happened so that we could get to the Congress of Vienna. Um, and somehow uh, that experience and that knowledge um, today in Iraq and in uh, uh, later capacities that I've um, held has become, has been very uh, useful and very um, informative. I really believe that we, unless we really understand what is happening on the ground, unless we come to grips with the realities of um, the daily tribulations of any country, we cannot uh, really understand the foreign policy or the diplomacy that is necessary uh, to fix uh, um, its, its problems or its challenges. I've been asked today to speak about um, what future for Iraq. Um, and let me first begin by saying that I, contrary to many others, I believe that Iraq has a future. Um, and I know that many people are quite skeptical um, as to uh, a society that has gone through um, endless cycles of violence, uh, division, um, internal uh, uh, strife, uh, religious, sectarian, um, and all kinds of uh, troubles that, that a country like that um, would have a future. But I strongly believe that it does. And I want to explain today why I believe that is the case. Um, more than 18 months ago, when I was asked to take up the position um, of UN Special Representative for Iraq, Iraq was the subject that nobody really wanted to deal with. Um, I remember somebody said that it was uh, the best view of Iraq was in the rear view mirror. Um, others uh, thought that it was over and that um, there are far more interesting and more important um, developments to deal with. Um, and by the time I got to Baghdad, um, and I will be very honest with you, we have a, the UN has a very large mission. We have um, about a, a little bit under. 1,000 people roughly at that point in, in Iraq with security and, um, and everyone in a massive budget. Getting there, it did really look like a little sleepy outpost because really nobody wanted to deal with Iraq. Um, people had been tired of it. But failing to deal with Iraq today has made Iraq again the center of global politics um, and the security debate well beyond the region of the, of the Middle East. Um, when I got to Baghdad, um, we, were, we were all talking about the Iraq being a country, uh, an upper middle income country um, that um, was on its way to become uh, perhaps a funder of UN programs in its own um, uh, territory. Um, a country that uh, didn't need that much international assistance. Many aid agencies had stepped out of Iraq the UN humanitarian team in um, the country was um, small, um, dealing with about 200,000 Syrian refugees and a small number of um, IDPs left over from previous conflicts in Iraq. Um, the uh, political problems that the country was facing, um, inclusion of uh, communities, um, cycle of violence, terrorism, they, they were all there, but they seemed somehow um, less uh, uh, in the focus of international attention um, as they are today. By the end of 2014, in just between Christmas and New Year's of 2000, sorry, 2013, be between Christmas and New Year's of 2013, we saw um, uh, the city of Ramadi and the city of Fallujah fall to the hands of ISIL. And within that one week or 10 days, 100,000 people were displaced. By the summer of 2014, uh, well over a million people were displaced in Iraq. By the end of 2014, well over 2 million people were displaced um, uh, by the conflict in Iraq. And many of them still 
uh, uh, remain uh, with very little prospect of going back to their, um, uh, to their homes. Um, in June of 2014, the city of Mosul, the second biggest city in Iraq, fell to the hands of ISIL. Within two months, we were talking about genocide against the minorities um, of Iraq. And since then, um, we have all in the international community um, become a little bit accustomed to seeing um, unacceptably gruesome images on TV of the atrocities that um, ISIL uh, is um, uh, undertaking. Throughout this period, it wasn't just the security that uh, changed, the security situation that changed in Iraq. Um, but today, hardly anyone can uh, call Iraq uh, an upper middle income country. Um, it is a state faced by very severe financial uh, and economic challenges on top of um, its security challenges. Um, it, uh, falling oil prices, um, the uh, massive uh, amount of money that has been rightly or wrongly spend on arming the Iraqi security forces um, in the battle against um, ISIL. Um, the uh, massive expansion of the um, uh, public sector wage bill under the previous government. All of this has today left Iraq with a, uh, a, a public sector deficit of well over 25% in its current budget for 2015. Um, and this is obviously uh, causing now much frustration and limiting many of the options that um, uh, both the Iraqi government or the international community can use to re help resolve uh, the situation in the country. So this all happened within the last year and a half. And now I, I know that it probably sounds to many as, well, why is he saying that the country has a future if all of this happened in just a year um, and the world has not been able to respond to that. Well, I do believe that the country has a future because despite all of these difficulties and these terrible uh, situations that we have had to face over the last year or so, um, there have been some sources of optimism that one needs to uh, look at um, and understand um, in the context of Iraqi politics. Firstly, um, in the summer of um, uh, last year, Iraq went through uh, a parliamentary election. Uh, one that was very much contested by the political parties um, in the country. Um, and despite uh, much skepticism, over 60% of Iraqis uh, turned out to vote. Yes, in some parts of the country, that percentage was substantially lower. But overall, over 60% of uh, Iraqis came out despite the car bombs and despite the um, um, uh, attacks. Um, uh, around uh, election day or during the election period, and they voted. And they made the right decision. They did not give any one political party the full majority uh, to run the country. Um, they, if you one looks at the results of that election, one sees that there is no, no one that can call themselves really um, a winner um, um, of that election. And given the challenges that the country faces, I think that was an extremely wise decision, collective decision um, by the people of Iraq, because it also sent a strong message to the political leaders of the country. Um, uh, uh, although some of them might, not, might have chosen not to hear that message, but that message was very loud and clear. And it said, you all need to work together. Um, and you all need to sit down and put your differences aside um, and, and move forward to save, um, to save the country. Um, and there are very good reasons why that message came from the public. Um, given the history of Iraq, one sees that the policy of having one community or one group um, dominate um, the entire environment in the country um, is a policy that is doomed to failure. Um, that policy cannot succeed in a country that is so, uh, so much like a mosaic of uh, ethnic and religious um, uh, groups. So, uh, the message from the people for unity, for uh, coming together uh, around the differences, um, was very clear and very much necessary at that time. So this is one, uh, uh, perhaps might, some might say small, but certainly a source of optimism. Um, the second was what happened um, in the days after that election, in the months after that election. And to the surprise of many who had sort of expected um, Iraq's political leaders either to um, um, descend into what they descended to in 2009, which was effectively spend about 
10 months figuring out who will be prime minister, president, or uh, speaker, um, and block the entire political process, um, they decided to do something else. They decided to uh, stick to the Constitution and to follow very strictly the limitations and the timelines and the guidelines that the Constitution has presented, moving first to um, elect a Speaker of Parliament, then to elect a new president, and finally to elect a new prime, prime minister and a government of national unity. Um, indeed, that was a, uh, a difficult period. Um, it was one that demanded on us in the UN mission in Iraq. Um, uh, uh, it put a lot of pressure on us because we were involved in a great number of uh, shuttling back and forward to make sure that this happens. Um, but it was something that was done by the Iraqi political leaders. Um, and with their uh, will and with their uh, decision. So this was another source of um, optimism, that actually out of this whole process, you formed a government that was truly representative of all the political forces in parliament. We often call it, um, obviously, a government of national unity. It is yet, however, to prove that it is also representative of the people uh, of Iraq and the challenges that they face. Um, and here's a third source uh, of optimism. Um, and that is that uh, if one looks carefully at what this government has um, set um, in its program, its ministerial program, its political agreement, it, that program contains all, um, if not all, many of the demands that have been there for years and years by the various um, communities in Iraq. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the details of that um, uh, later. But many of these demands that have come through from um, um, the communities in the western provinces, the, so the Sunni provinces, uh, for amnesty, um, for changing the um, uh, restrictive debasification laws. All of this um, has found its place in the program of the government. Similarly, demands that have um, uh, traditionally been um, put forward by uh, the south of the country, the Shia provinces, are there for decentralizing power, for ensuring that um, um, that um, uh, problems of poverty um, are addressed uh, quickly um, and effectively. Um, uh, the Kurds, the north of the country, um, have also re-engaged with the government um, of Iraq um, uh, and the entire political process. So these are three very um, important sources of optimism for um, uh, Iraq's future that have emerged um, uh, within uh, the last 12 months, and I think uh, for me personally and for our mission, they signify that uh, there is hope. I mean, obviously, when you open up Pandora's box and all of the snakes and devils and frogs come out at the very end of all the snakes and devils and frogs, you find a little bit of a glimmer of hope. And maybe this is what we're hanging on to right now um, as being that, um, that glimmer. Um, there are many risks, however, um, uh, to the future. Um, and these risks um, uh, are very substantial. Obviously, the first um, and most important risk is presented by the fact that ISIL still controls um, um, a substantial uh, part of uh, Iraq's territory, um, effectively controls two provinces, Anbar and, and, and Nineveh, and controls them in a very brutal uh, way. Um, in my first briefing to the Security Council, um, late 2013, I started that briefing by saying that ISIL is working to turn um, eastern Syria and western Iraq into one battlefield. Um, and to all of us, uh, that evidence was very clear and very visible um, as early as that period. Um, uh, ISIL was harvesting um, the Nineveh province for months before the fall of Mosul. Um, and, I put, and I use the word harvesting because one can very easily see, if one looks at the details of what was happening then, that there was a clear strategy, a clear strategy to undermine uh, public institutions. There is not an elected official or a local council official or a, 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 a community leader in that province that had not been killed kidnapped or in some way threatened um, or uh, pushed away by ISIL well before the fall of Mosul um, into their hands. So there was a clear strategy to undermine um, uh, public institutions. Um, and we could clearly see that there were uh, waves of this strategy 
um, aimed at um, uh, driving a wedge within the sectarian divisions that exist within Iraqi society. So for certain periods, we would see a rise of uh, attacks on um, um, uh, Shia Husseiniyas. Um, then a few weeks later, there would be a number of attacks clearly coordinated on mosques or on churches, um, on minorities. Uh, very visibly, this was, these were different waves that um, ISIL was using to, uh, to undermine the uh, situation in, in the province. Um, kidnapping had become a big business. Um, a fear uh, for one's life, for one's property, for one's children um, had been per become pervasive um, in, in, in the Ninawa province. Um, if one looks at, uh, again, at the pattern of violence, um, one sees that there were, there, were, there were periods in which uh, perhaps the most gruesome at that point, which we saw, was schools being attacked by um, suicide bombers. Um, and th these were women suicide bombers going into schools to explode themselves. And this was not one incident, or not two incidents, but this was a, a very coordinated um, effort. So ISIL had a strategy well before getting, coming into Mosul to um, um, undermine everything, to destroy the links th that exist in, in, in that um, society, to uh, drive a wedge, as I said, between the communities, to, to exploit the differences that exist. Um, and that strategy has been very clear. And I think if one looks with, with the benefit of hindsight today at what is happening, um, even as we speak in, across Iraq or um, in Syria or, or, or further afield now in Libya, one sees that this strategy of fear and, 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 and Spreading fear is very um, much uh, uh, visible. But that strategy would have failed had it not been, uh, had the Iraqi state been strong um, and had the institutions uh, of Iraq been strong. And they were weak, and they were extremely weak. Um, the fact that um, uh, public services um, in some places were non existent contributed to this. The fact that you had the sectarian divisions. Um, and that have plagued Iraq's history at least uh, for a number of years now, um, uh, visible also uh, did not help. The fact that you had tribe um, um, stand against tribe um, and community against community and all kinds of issues, uh, territorial, disputed areas, disputed between Baghdad and Erbil, um, all kinds of divisions in this, uh, in this province uh, clearly uh, uh, did not help to that. And so, so I still find fertile ground for uh, their, their, their strategy. And thirdly, it was not by chance that Nineveh, the province of Nineveh, um, was, was targeted. Um, if one looks at Iraq's map and the map of the region, that is the province that has the strategic key to many questions um, in both in Iraq and in Syria. It is the province through which uh, pipelines from the south go to the north into Turkey carrying oil. It is the province through which much of the um, uh, water supplies for Iraq flow south. So whoever controls Mosul, who controls these areas, obviously um, it takes the whole country more or less um, as a hostage. So all of this was visible well before um, the fall of Mosul, and it had been developing um, as, a, um, as, as a strategy. On June 9th of 2014, um, I went to see the Prime Minister with a very big map of the city of Mosul because the security analysis that the United Nations team had done was that the city was under imminent threat and would fall um, into the hands of ISIL as a large number of uh, fighters, most of them foreign fighters, had crossed over from Syria into Iraq. Um, the threat to the city was imminent um, and we wanted to alert the, uh, the, the, the Prime Minister that. Uh, unless um, the Iraqi security forces and the Kurdish um, and Peshmerga cooperate, the city is likely to fall um, into the hands of ISIL, pretty much as Ramadi or Fallujah had done earlier. Um, what we could not have foreseen at that point was that the Iraqi army would disintegrate um, and that this would create and I want to make this point very, very clear, that this would create the disintegration of the Iraqi army, not the strength of ISIL, would create the myth of the invincibility of this terrorist organization. Because within 48 hours or so after the fall of Mosul, 
um, the Iraqi security forces between Mosul and Baghdad, about, what is it, 900 or 1,000 kilometers, um, uh, disintegrated and melted away. Um, so uh, ISIL and their friends uh, did not uh, fight their way down to the gates of Baghdad. They sort of walked down to the gates of Baghdad. Um, and there are many reasons why this disintegration happened. And they all go back to the weak institutions um, of Iraq, to the sectarian divisions that, um, that exist, to the um, lack of national unity within the representation of the army, corruption, um, and a lack of um, um, ideology um, and, um, um, and, a, and, a, and a spirit of uh, unity within the armed forces. All of these things very much necessary. Probably I wouldn't have paid any attention to them had it not been for war studies at King's, but having gone through that, I now pay a lot of attention to things like that. Um, but to me, that uh, fallout, that, that, that massive uh, fallout of, of the Iraqi army, uh, created the myth of the invincibility of ISIL. And it did provide ISIL also with two very, very important things. One, lots and lots and lots of weapons. From bases that they were able to raid um, and take over pretty much um, uh, uh, easily. Um, uh, heavy weapons, light weapons, whatever you need. And secondly, at least, at least, at the very least, half a billion dollars from the central bank um, coffers in Mosul. Um, this is a conservative estimate of what they were able to gain. Now, I'm pretty sure that Mr. Baghdadi, when he was uh, sitting somewhere planning his, um, his operations, even he had no idea that he would, he would suddenly be in control of such a large um, territory. And thirdly, they were able to succeed because they struck alliances on the ground with tribes, with armed groups, um, who had various grievances um, against the government, um, who perceived the government to be Shia-dominated, who perceived their security not to be um, uh, provided um, for by, such by that government, who perceived to be um, uh, isolated and, 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 and marginalized, um, and, and all kinds of reasons that we have, uh, you know, all of us have seen and have discussed many, on many occasions um, before. But these are the reasons that created this is how ISIL took over a large part um, um, of Iraq. Um, and this risk still remains there. Because if in the beginning, um, and this I can attest to because of, we've had lots of contacts with people who um, um, belong to various groups that, and tribes um, in, these, um, in these areas. Um, in the, if in the beginning they sort of gladly joined Daesh uh, because they thought that that was uh, a good idea to stand up against um, um, the government. Um, today, they stay with Daesh out of fear um, uh, because ISIL has begun to implement a new phase of its strategy, and that is the complete decapitation and destruction of tribal structures in the areas that they control of any uh, uh, dissent or any difference of uh, opinion that, uh, uh, that, that um, uh, may emerge. Um, so now that um, initial um, quote-unquote excitement for those who wanted to join them because they thought it was a good idea um, has been uh, replaced by, by fear. Um, uh, so this risk of ISIL still needs to be addressed. And this is the big, big question for Iraq today um, and its future. How do you restore sovereign control of the territory um, of Iraq to the legitimate um, uh, government um, in Baghdad? Um, and obviously, there are different ways of doing that. And somebody earlier today asked me, well, should it be the political solution first or should it be the security um, uh, solution first? And I, um, it, it, is, it, it is not a chicken or egg question. It's a chicken and egg question. Um, you cannot uh, defeat um, ISIL only through military operations. Um, but you cannot also defeat ISIL only through political moves. It has to be a combination of both. Um, there is clearly space for um, security um, uh, operations, um, and they demand the um, a concerted action of the Iraqi security forces on the ground and uh, the international coalition um, in the air, not on the ground. Um, and, they, uh, uh, and that is one set of issues, but then there's also a political agenda that needs, to be, uh, that needs to be developed. On the security front, um, 
the disintegration of the Iraqi army was so uh, swift and, and, and terrible that it will take uh, much time to rebuild that army and much effort to rebuild it on a truly national basis. It is not just about providing weapons or training to soldiers. It's about building the whole infrastructure that you need to sustain um, a national um, a military uh, force. And that period will take a lot of time, I'm sure. Um, in the interim, what um, um, Iraq has been working on now quite intensely is to provide um, for the creation of a national guard um, in the entire country, which would allow the provinces of Iraq to take more responsibility for their own um, security. And that has become the, the key uh, uh, linchpin right now of the, the debate. That uh, uh, National Guard is necessary because the people on the ground who, have, who are maybe willing or interested in standing up to Daesh and, and fighting them do not just want weapons and money, they want also security. They want to be recognized as part of a state structure. They don't want to be seen as vigilantes who are fighting um, Daesh today and tomorrow will be sort of put to the side and, and tanked um, uh, and, and life will go on. They need security. Um, and that security comes through the, through the National Guard, which would allow each province to have its own force um, under the um, uh, command of um, uh, the Iraqi security forces. Um, um, but these forces will be local, they will be uh, from people from the communities, um, and they would allow for the uh, communities to be, take more responsibility for their own security. So this is the first interim um, necessary measure before the rest of the Iraqi security forces are, um, are reconstructed. So this is one part of the, um, um, of the risk. There is one risk, uh, th this is one, one way of uh, mitigating that risk. Um, there's a second issue which transcends security and politics, um, and that is the existence of militias in Iraq. Um, uh, militias have existed in Iraq for quite a few years now, despite the fact that the Constitution quite clearly bans them. Um, however, they have taken a new life, they have taken a new role today. Um, after the fall of Mosul, um, um, they became part of um, a response to the um, uh, fatwa issued by um, Grand Ayatollah Ali Sistani, the uh, senior uh, Shia cleric in Iraq who came out and called on people to stand and defend their country against terrorism. Um, many interpreted that call um, in a sectarian manner. Um, that is still to be um, uh, questioned whether it was really um, a sectarian call or not, because um, uh, he uh, all, even had to issue a clarification to his fatwa to say that he's calling on people to work with the security forces legitimately to defend their country. But the net effect of this was that a large number of people from the south of the country um, stood up and took arms um, uh, to protect Iraq against, um, uh, against Daesh. And in many of these um, uh, formations, you see the uh, militias from the south uh, who have now taken um, on a new life. Um, I say that this is an issue that transcends politics and security because it is a security issue. It is a force that is outside of the control of the um, government um, that needs to be brought into the, uh, into the hands of the legitimate authorities. It cannot replace the army or the police um, at any point. But it is also a political issue because many within the Sunni community respond to this um, as a threat. Um, and they say quite legitimately that they do not want you know, their areas to be liberated from ISIL by people who don't belong to the areas where they, um, they live. And they don't want to turn this into a, another sectarian um, um, a conflict with, you know, one militia on one side and another militia on the other side. Um, so this is a, this is a substantial uh, risk that needs to be mitigated. And again, it goes back to the um, uh, construction and, and, and the development of this National Guard concept. And lastly, there are the political risks and the political measures that need to be taken. Um, one can um, do all the right things on the security front with all the goodwill in the world. But unless people feel that the state has recognized them, has provided them with respect and dignity, has addressed their legitimate demands for justice, uh, for accountability, um, uh, for crimes that have been committed, um, has addressed issues uh, related to, again, I go back to poverty, one issue that is often uh, not, uh, focus, not in the focus enough in Iraq, but it is a very substantial issue. 
um, um, an amnesty uh, for those who have been held without uh, trial for many years. We have people who have spent up to uh, five years, at least five years, um, in um, detention without trial. Uh, we have people who are uh, in prison, despite the fact that the court has found them not guilty. They still remain in prison, um, a bit of a catch-22 situation, but there's a legal requirement in Iraq that even if the court finds you not guilty, um, then you have to be, but before you are released, the Ministry of Interior needs to send a very nice letter saying there are no other charges on the basis of which you could be um, uh, uh, tried again and imprisoned. Um, and it's a very sort of bureaucratic uh, hangover from, from, from the old days. Um, but we have those people. There, there are people who have been, um, the, uh, so, th so this whole issue of amnesty of people who are being held without trial or in prison um, has become a very big political um, uh, debate. And it goes across communities. It is not, um, as some often perceive it, to be uh, an issue with just one of the communities. Um, other political issues, um, uh, the debathification laws. Um, uh, today, um, if you were a member of the Ba'ath Party, um, uh, you cannot hold any post in Iraq um, unless you uh, wiggle yourself through a very shady process um, and you get uh, quote-unquote debasified. Um, there's now an, uh, a proposal by the government, which has uh, gone to parliament a few days ago, uh, to say, let's change all of this. So it doesn't matter if you were a member of the Ba'ath Party, you get your rights back to your pension, your salary, whatever it is. Um, you will not be touched by any of these laws if you were an ordinary member of the Ba'ath Party. If you were a senior leader, you will uh, still be, there will still be limitations um, on you. If anyone has an issue with a crime that has been committed, that crime needs to be uh, looked at in the court of law, not outside of it. Um, and it also introduces a ban on the existence of the, uh, and the, rec the uh, revival of the um, uh, Saddam Hussein's Ba'ath Party. Now, this has become, again, one of these issues that often gets debated, as in, it would in any society, but it is an important step forward, um, and we need to, uh, to encourage it. So this is all part of a political package that needs to be put in place um, in order for the country to be able to, uh, to come back and for the benefits of um, um, uh, uh, defeating ISIL or freeing territory from ISIL to be um, really substantially um, uh, justified and exploited by um, society. Um, then there are all kinds of details that one needs to look at. Um, some of them are quite fascinating. Uh, I will just note one, and that is um, what do you do in terms of reconstruction and recovery in the areas that have been uh, freed from Daesh? How do you restore public services? How do you rebuild infrastructure? Um, all of these things. How do you in introduce programs for um, community reconciliation? Uh, we within the UN are now working on a proposal with the government jointly to set up a, an international fund to fund such activity in the areas that are liberated, so to say, from ISIL in the future. And the Iraqi government has uh, put about a billion um, dinars um, into this initiative already, so we now need to figure out how to get the mechanisms so that the international community can help um, um, in that as well. Um, and all kinds of details um, at that level. Now, all of these you know, sources of optimism, um, risks that exist, ISIL, militias, the regional environment, um, which is increasingly um, uh, uh, very volatile um, uh, around Iraq, um, the Syrian crisis, all of these are risks that need to be mitigated and can be mitigated. But the only way to do that is if you have unity within the country national unity, all of the communities working together, if you have uh, cooperation between Iraq and its neighbors, um, and today we have much more of that than before. Um, uh, today uh, we see, you know, the Iraqi prime minister has been visiting not just Iran, but has been going to Kuwait and to the United Arab Emirates and to Turkey and to Jordan. The president was recently in Qatar and before that he was in Saudi. Things that you know, a year or two ago would have seemed quite, uh, quite impossible. So restoring these links to the neighbors and restoring that um, um, sort of at least beginnings of normalization with, um, um, with, uh, with your neighbors is very important. 
Um, unity also within the international community, and most importantly, unity within the Security Council. Um, Iraq has been one of those issues within the Security Council in which we have seen um, unity among the five mem permanent member states in the entire um, uh, council. That has been not the case with Syria, uh, certainly not the case with Ukraine, um, and certainly um, it, um, uh, the whole debate on terrorism and extremism um, um, is easily uh, risked uh, by uh, divisions around Syria and other places. Um, but Iraq has had that unity, and this is very, very um, important to date. So, um, it is going to be extremely difficult to mitigate these risks, but it is not impossible to mitigate. Um, because the fallout of a breakup of the country of Iraq, for the people of that country, and for the region in its entirety, would be unimaginable. Um, the difficulties that would be created would be unimaginable. Uh, and the, there's a strong interest now, a much stronger interest than before within the country, within Iraq, to find solutions despite the differences um, and, and to allow the country to move forward. It is happening at a very slow pace and sometimes for many of us it can become um, extremely annoying, uh, annoyingly slow. Uh, but it is there, and we need to in, need to encourage it. Um, that is why the, uh, a couple of days ago, when I gave my last uh, presentation to the Security Council, um, I um, said that I'm leaving this uh, position as a paranoid optimist. I'm optimistic about um, all the things that can go right, and I'm absolutely paranoid that they will all go wrong. Um, so we need to be very, very careful at what we uh, do and how we do it. What is it that we, uh, from the outside, can do, and what is it that we cannot do? We cannot do it for the Iraqis. And if we try to do it for them, we will miserably fail, and we will make their life even worse. So all we can do is help, and all we can do is provide advice, and provide um, ideas, and provide experience, and provide um, knowledge, um, facilitate contacts, um, and all of that, but at the end of the day, it is their country, it is their ways, and our time internationally um, in a country like Iraq, Iraq um, is ultimately very short. Um, so all we can do is really help. But that help is very much necessary uh, today. If Iraq is to be left alone without the attention of the world, it, if it is considered to be a, something to look at in a rear view mirror, um, it will certainly come and hit us all in the front of our faces very fast and very, um, in a very dangerous way. Um, this is why I'm also encouraged that now there's this increased focus on um, support um, uh, for Iraq um, uh, than uh, a year or two years ago, um, and that support needs to materialize constantly in initiatives and um, in, in proposals um, and in a partnership with a country that desperately needs it. At the end of the day, for all of us who live there and talking to ordinary Iraqis, most of whom do not really care who is Shia, Sunni, Christian, Yazidi, um, a Kurd, or Arab. They really want to get on with, 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 get on with their lives. And as long as uh, sectarian politics uh, divides them and, and, and violence, and um, uh, as long as those, uh, the, 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 these uh, facts that we see today continue, uh, these ordinary people will have, uh, will have trouble. Um, the vast majority of Iraqis do not have um, foreign passports to use to flee to other countries. Um, the vast majority of uh, Iraqis do not have houses in um, countries nearby and afar. Um, they have to get on with the country that they have uh, and with the lives that they have. And it is they that actually I find most inspiring um, in our work and most demanding, um, if, you, if you wish, from um, the world to do something and help them uh, through these difficult times. So thank you very much for this opportunity. I'm sorry I spoke a little bit too long. I'm planning to do it shorter, but I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. No, you certainly haven't, haven't taken too long and, and you have certainly set the scene explaining um, in, in, in an amazing way how much uh, 
uh, the challenges, how many challenges are left, and, and, and we're struck by how you can even remain an optimist, having said all of those challenges and, and looking ahead at the future. Um, something among, among your, your, your presentation, you, you, you kept having a balance between the need to really reinforce or enforce national unity, um, but also clearly the sectarian tensions. Mm -hmm. Um, as an SRSG, as the representative of the Secretary General and very much the embodiment of the international community in Iraq, how have you, where have you struck the pen pendulum there? You have mentioned a number of measures, notably the National Guards, the need maybe to devolve more authority to the provinces and to various groups in terms of security and in, and in other terms, yet you're really keen as well to really enforce national unity. How do you reconcile those two objectives and what is the right way of doing it? Well, for us in the, um, the mission, we're, um, we're in a unique situation because we are really um, one of the few entities that is able to talk to everybody. Um, and when I say everybody, I mean we talk not just to the political leaders, but also to community leaders, to uh, groups that are outside of the political process, um, and um, um, perhaps very importantly, um, also to the religious authorities in Najaf. Um, and um, this role that the United Nations now has in Iraq is uh, perhaps unique in the ability to uh, reach out to everyone and to, um, to really uh, liaise and to uh, flush out ideas and to help that communication. Um, in the longer run, it's important to have somebody do that. You can't have the United Nations do that forever. Um, um, President Talibani was somebody who sort of used to do that role uh, quite effectively in Iraq, so there will need to be a, uh, an Iraqi way of, uh, of, of doing it. On the broader question of uh, balance, it's really the um, understanding that um, uh, no community in Iraq can control the whole country. And that at every point that one community has tried to control the whole country, it has failed miserably and it has become at a very high human cost. So um, to change that in the longer run, I think the goal must remain the um, um, moving away from sec the sectarian political uh, division um, in Iraq. Uh, there's hardly a political party of any significance today in Iraq that doesn't have an exclusively sectarian um, constituency. Uh, but because that is the system um, uh, that has evolved, uh, you know, we might want to say as much as we want that you know, it should be different, but that's what it is. You, know, so you need to get to the point at which it can become different. Um, but um, also, quite importantly, it's to look at um, really uh, what are the fundamental problems and challenges that the communities themselves identify. Um, if you talk to the um, uh, Shia in the south, for example, sometimes uh, if you don't know about the details about Iraq and you sort of walk into it for the first time, you might think you're talking to a minority, um, although you know, they are uh, you know, the majority of the uh, population. Um, because of that fear that something will happen and it will all be taken away, we will be again reduced to a minority. We will be oppressed. That fear from the past, um, the only way to guarantee that is to say, look, democracy is there to stay. It's not about transitioning to dictatorship. It's about transitioning away from dictatorship. You talk to the Kurds, um, and they also feel like a minority um, uh, in, in, their own, in, in their country. Um, you talk to the, to the Sunnis, and they feel like a minority. I sometimes wonder, you know, if you talk to everyone who feels like a minority, who's actually the majority of uh, uh, people and then obviously there are the real minorities, the Christians, the uh, Yazidi, others. Um, so getting away from that mentality of you know the fear of the past is always about um, you know finding what it is that the community needs addressed, not the political leaders, because often the political leaders are not um, strong enough or not uh, you know do not uh, exhibit enough the demands of the. Uh, of the community. Um, and finally, you know, from my own personal experience back home, um, when you have a country move from dictatorship and to democracy and you draft a new constitution, you sort of draft that constitution in a way to protect yourself from the past. 
because you don't know what will happen in the future. Um, sometime down the road, Iraq will really need to look at its constitution, because now at least there's been some a number of years in which you see what works, what doesn't, uh, things you which you have you could not have seen perhaps in the beginning, if, even if you'd had a uh, a crystal ball. Um, at least that's in, in, in our experience that has been the case, that when, when our constitution was drafted in 1990, many of the problems today that we have with the constitution we could not have even imagined back in 1990. So that, that's the natural process of uh, revision. And that's also part of this balance and unity. Um, as part of that trajectory that you are describing of, of really that th those political parties really seeking to um, obtain better guarantees by really regulating their own affairs at, at, at various community level. Um, one evolution that we have seen clearly over the last few years has really been legal changes, including on, in particular on the various individual status. And mm -hmm. something that we're all very aware of was, for instance, different regulations pertaining to early marriage being creating a lot of, of interest. How do you see that trend? And do you, do you actually see any possibility of those sorts of trends to be reversed? And, and how, then, as a UN representative, did you deal with those sorts of tensions vis-a-vis international standards? Uh, we took a very firm stand against uh, this initiative to introduce um, changes to the, to the family court. Um, I had sort of uh, uh, fully covered women protesting against me, and very fascinating pictures of what that looks like. Um, um, but I think that Iraq has, at the end of the day, a tradition. It, it is the first Arab country that came with a civil code uh, in, in the 50s or whenever it was. And there's a strong tradition for that. And when this proposal came uh, to parliament, um, there was massive rejection of it. Uh, not just from the uh, secular elite of the country, but also from some of the religious uh, leaders. Um, it, was an it was an interesting uh, way that different Marjia and, and Najaf were not happy with that proposal. Um, um, and they, made, they found ways to make that very, very clear. So I think there's a strong base against that uh, reverse. So I'm not sure how long that would be, and obviously that one needs to be very careful with it. Uh, but on the broader question of legal changes, um, one very substantial challenge that the country faces is the mess that its legal system is. You have Saddam Hussein era legislation. On top of it, you have some of Mr. Bremer's edicts, or whatever they're called, um, uh, that, that dismiss parts of Iraqi legislation and change it and introduce others. Then you have laws that have been adopted by the new parliament. Um, and um, um, it is a, you know, a, a system that has so many loopholes in it that not just is a source of corruption, but is such just a source of unclarity uh, of, of, of the legal process. Uh, we hope now in uh, March to have a very uh, important, what we hope is a very important conference with the uh, Speaker of Parliament on criminal justice reform in Iraq. Uh, because just the criminal justice reform system is, 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 is a complete hodgepodge of things that need to be looked at uh, comprehensively. Um, and obviously that's not going to happen overnight and it will take uh, time and it will take uh, a concerted effort. But it's also one of the issues that we want to alert the international community to that that's what we should also be focusing on. Okay, thank you and, and, and there again for being optimistic. Any, I mean, I would like at this point to really open questions from the floor. I, I, I take it that there are many questions. Yes, yes. There is a microphone. Okay. And if you could please um, introduce yourself first. Thank you. Hello, sir. Uh, my name is Monica. I'm a first year mall student here at the Fletcher School. Uh, I actually have two questions. One, uh, you briefly touched on. So what are the root causes of the formation of this ISO group? Uh, the second question is, do you think there's any uh, misinterpretation of the threat that this group pose, um, poses? And if so, to what degree? Thank you. Let me take you want, OK, person. we'll take. Yes? But it's better with a microphone still, yes. 
Uh, yes, hello. My name is Oliver Ofcha. I'm a fellow at Harvard University, and in real life, I come from the German government. And I wanted to follow up on the role the international community can play. And you said basically it's a role of help and advice. Um, currently, we have a UN mission, which pro probably has an enormous potential, but a huge lack of resources. And we have coalition that leads the fight against ISIL, which has many resources, but lacks a little bit the potential, uh, the p potential for the future. If, if you had the freedom to design the optimal form of international cooperation, uh, support for Iraq, how would it look like? And, and would um, a stronger involvement of regional partners be necessary also with the perspective of developing regional solutions for regional problems? Thank you. Okay, we'll take one, yes? One more and then we give you space to answer. Good evening, my name is Rabia. I'm a first year MALD. Mr. Zafarov, Zakharov actually, um, advised me to ask you this question during our seminar earlier today. <laughs> he, uh, my question is, what lessons can we draw from the Balkans? I'm interested in hearing your point of view as an Eastern European, sort of the parallels and the lessons we can draw from that conflict in the early 1990s. All right. Wow, that's a fascinating question. Why didn't you talk about that in your seminar? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, right, first to uh, Monica's question about the root causes um, um, of ISO. Um, let's, I mean, again, this is my opinion, but I, I, I get quite opinionated about it because when one sees the destruction that, that they've caused there, one cannot just sort of detach themselves from it. Um, ISO is a terrorist organization, let's be honest. It's a terrorist organization that seeks to destroy the state of Iraq and replace it with a state of terror. That's, that's it. Um, it has managed to develop a, 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 a following, a liking, if you wish, for various target audiences that allow it to have access to foreign fighters and others, um, and it is... Uh, you know, become what it is effectively today. Uh, in some cases, I wonder if it's just a Twitter account, if not uh, more than, than that. But it is there. It is, an, uh, it is a brand. It is, has its own ideology. It has its own um, uh, terrorist uh, goals. Um, it works in an environment that can only be conducive to it. In Iraq, that conducive environment was created by the perceived marginalization of the Sunnis um, in Iraq by the sectarian divisions, by the um, lack of services. I mean, honestly, this country, uh, what is it, 2003 to 2015, we still have parts of the country that don't have electricity, uh, fully uh, restored health care, education. So there are a lot of these uh, problems that make people angry um, and people turn to religion, they turn to other things, and then finally they turn to um, um, something that is uh, as radical as, as, as ISIL. Um, but it also is, uh, has been facilitated by other factors. Um, it has been facilitated by the fact that quite a number of um, former Ba'ath Party officers um, chose, chose to join the ranks of ISIL um, and became their military um, uh, command. There was a fascinating, a gruesome but fascinating incident uh, sometime last year where they managed to get hold of um, a few barrages on the river. Um, and um, they controlled the area of these few barrages and they sort of stopped the water in some parts and opened the barrage in other parts in a way that effectively flooded from the, I think it was from the Euphrates, all the way to the outskirts of Baghdad, to Abu Ghraib. Um, the city was flooded. And the goal of that was to effectively sort of stop the ability of the Iraqi forces to move uh, towards them. Um, very tricky uh, issue. And they turned you know, the use of water into a terrorism resource. But if one looks at the history of Iraq, that was done by the Iraqi army in the south during the Iran war, when Basra and large areas around Basra were flooded to stop Iranian advances. Um, it was the same officers belonging to the same corps that were responsible for both.
So that's an enabling factor. I mean, I'm sorry, but that's not a root cause for ISIS. That's an enabling factor for, for a terrorist organization to, uh, uh, to, to gain. Um, is there any misinterpretation? Um, I don't know. I don't think so. I don't think we, I mean, I think there's a broader problem that we all need to look at. Um, and that is, obviously, you know, this, I'm not saying anything new, but this whole issue of why do people in uh, Europe, uh, elsewhere, uh, there was a very interesting article in the New York Times yesterday about an Egyptian middle class guy who chose to join um, ISIL. Why does that happen? Um, and what is it that can be done to prevent that? Right, you can put, you can criminalize, I don't know, ISIL ideology. You can say that if you wave the flag, you'll be arrested. But does that stop really uh, people choosing that path? Or is it more about um, how we, in our own countries, um, resolve social problems and integrate, you know, whether it's minorities or, or other groups, um, so that we prevent that um, from happening. And yet, at the end of the day, you think, well, you know, I'm sorry, but the incident in Paris or the incident in um, uh, Copenhagen or the, the other incident with the uh, kosher su supermarket in Paris, what does that have to do with the integration of Sunnis in Iraq? I mean, where's the link? So there are a lot of these questions that need to be, uh, to be looked at. But I don't think there's a misrepresentation. In fact, I think that we're not maybe we're not representing enough how dangerous this, uh, this uh, problem of ISIL is. Uh, because I distinctly remember meetings not, not long ago, very, very recently, with ministers and countries in the Arab world who were saying in those meetings very openly to me, ISIL is not our problem, that's in Iraq, and today we see them bombing other countries. Um, so, you know, this is uh, obviously growing at a rapid pace. Um, Oliver's question on um, uh, sort of the optimal form of the UN, of the uh, international engagement in Iraq. Um, the UN it, it has a good mandate. Um, um, it's broad. It's not too, it's not impossible to implement. I don't think we really need more resources to do it. It's a lot of political work that needs to be uh, to be done. Um, definitely, there's a, a place for re for the region um, um, in many many different areas. There's there's one um, issue that I've not been able to get any traction on, um, and that is to say, look, Iraq needs to sit down with all of its neighbors, um, perhaps excluding one Syria because of its own situation now, but at least get Turkey, Iran, Saudi, the others together, um, and sit together and agree on uh, principles that will be supported um, um, in Iraq. But obviously that is very difficult. But there are other roles as well. Um, uh, you cannot fight Daesh um, without, you, you cannot fight Daesh militarily, politically, or ideologically without the support of the countries in the um, uh, in the Gulf and in the Arab, uh, Arab world. Reconstruction funding. Iraq is really facing a massive, uh, very serious economic uh, crisis now. And if you want to reconstruct uh, parts of the country after the uh, liberation from, from Daesh, you need to look for funding else so somewhere. Um, humanitarian support. All of these things um, um, are necessary. But really, what um, uh, in terms of a regional solution to a regional problem, um, uh, you need to set up some infrastructure that allows for um, a country like Iraq and its neighbors to uh, engage consistently on a daily basis, to rebuild trust, to, to, uh, to, be able to exchange information. We're talking now at a very, very basic level. I mean, reopen an embassy, appoint an ambassador. Um, then if you move further up, uh, issues of intelligence sharing, uh, security cooperation, all of these things um, uh, would be necessary. Um, then there are other issues, uh, uh, the training of the Iraqi army, the rebuilding of the Iraqi army, um, the rebuilding of the Iraqi security forces, um, the rebuilding of the Iraqi police force. Uh, that's a separate issue in, in its entirety. Um, and that's where perhaps Europe could play a, an important role because um, Iraqi police, trained under Saddam Hussein, 
as you can imagine, doesn't hold you know, human rights to the highest of standards. Uh, with all due respect to the um, uh, training provided by the Americans, once they came into Iraq, most of it was focused on anti-terrorism, tactics, and all of that. Uh, clearly, that also uh, lacks a little bit in human rights protection standards. So we need to really to get somebody to, pro pro to, to, to um, support the Iraqi police in um, uh, providing community policing, civil, civilian policing, all of these things that they have uh, uh, experience uh, and, and they need to learn from other places. And lessons from the Balkans, God, where do I start? I don't know where to start. I mean, it's not Yugoslavia, uh, Iraq, it's not Yugoslavia. Um, and, and please let us never make it. Um, but, uh, but clearly what we did see, um, and I say this with a great deal of sadness in Bosnia, um, that at the end of the day, population movements um, happen and they become permanent um, and, and the country somehow needs deals with that and moves forward. Um, I think at the end of all of this, whatever this is in Iraq, um, we will see a different ethnic uh, map of the country. Uh, people would have moved around um, and some may never go back to their homes. Um, it's very sad to say that today, but that's what many of them tell us as well. Um, then uh, transitional justice is necessary. You cannot go uh, through such change as Iraq is going without um, uh, transitional justice. Um, in the Balkans, what we had sort of the magnet of the European Union you don't have that uh, in Iraq uh, uh, anywhere. But what we did have, what we did realize very soon is that you've got to go through the laundry list of the problems with, between your country and your neighbors and start cleaning that laundry list. Um, and, um, and sometimes just you know, put the history and the very exciting um, uh, things that we like to talk about in the Balkans over rakia and some nice salad in the evening and sing songs about them put them in the back of our minds and just move forward uh, with the reality of today. B bring, build strong private sector. Um, Iraq's economy is entirely reliant on oil. Uh, private enterprise, private sector, uh, deregulate. My God, the, the regulations they have in terms of starting a business uh, are mind-boggling. Um, and uh, clean up that entire mess. And again, back in the Balkans, that was an important thing to bring investors in. And, um, and things like that. Um, education. Uh, look at education. Um, often in, um, uh, back in my own country, there was a few months ago, there was a, a big debate because somebody said, oh my God, they've changed the history textbooks for the, uh, for, for the kids and, and now they say different things than what they said under communism. Well, obviously they would. Um, I mean, this needs to happen um, in Iraq as well. Um, uh, stigmas on some communities um, are, are taught in schools. Um, it's going to be very, very difficult. It'll be far more difficult, perhaps, than um, what many of us experienced. Because if you look at the history of the country, uh, uh, effectively, everything after Hammurabi is some form of um, is debatable or, or some, somebody might find it offensive. Um, um, so uh, there's, that needs to happen um, as well. Uh, but plenty, and, and I think a lot, of, uh, a lot of people from the Balkans and from Central and Eastern Europe, countries of tr that have gone through transition, can help Iraq because they, we've lived through our own transition and we know how painful and difficult it is. Um, and we can relate to it. Um, and often that, that helps you in communicating with people and helps you in understanding what, uh, what, what needs to be done. Great, thank you. Yes, we'll take another round of questions. Please, yes. Please. yes? Sorry, please, if you could just wait for the mic, which is just coming. Thank you. Uh, Mohammed Maliki, I'm from uh, Iraq. I'm a fellow at uh, uh, the Weatherhead Center at Harvard. 
Um, I just finished a visit um, uh, to Iraq for three weeks to, during the winter break, and uh, I toured most of the South, and I said uh, a few days in Baghdad, and if you ask people um, in the South, th their first priority is not really ISIS, it's, it's corruption and lack of services. I just wonder if you, you can expand on that, give, give us your sense of, of that sort of major grievance that you said poverty is an issue and it's not talked about. And it, that's exactly sort of matches my sense of the country as a priority that is neglected and perhaps underlies much of the other problems that the country has. And the second question is, what's your sense of the, if, if any if there's any pro progress on the national reconciliation undertaken by the new government and your sense of the new government uh, sort of in, in general. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Um. Okay, you can start there and we'll have you. Yes. Hi, my name is Warren. I'm a MIB student here at Fletcher. And my question is sort of twofold. Uh, how dependent is Iraqi stability on Syrian stability? And then out of that question I have, uh, the Iranian government is working pretty hard to prop up the regimes in both Damascus and Baghdad. So what sort of actions or responsibilities does the Iranian government need to take to ensure stability in both of these countries? Good afternoon, sir. My name is Adam Jackson. I'm a first year mauled here at Fletcher. Um, so earlier you described yourself as a paranoid optimist. And I don't mean to harp on the paranoid aspect, but I was a Marine who served in Iraq in Fallujah and Ramadi in uh, 2007 during the troop surge. And I sat through many chai sessions where my superiors worked very hard at diplomacy to try and bring the Sunni tribal leaders into the government and trying to incorporate them into the new Iraq that we were trying to create during the occupation. And I'm curious today, after the perceived disenfranchisement that the Sunnis felt in Anbar from some members of the Iraqi government who worked very hard to centralize power following the end of the American occupation and who still have a role, a very prominent role in Iraqi politics, what can we do to really reincorporate them into the government. And as Daesh takes efforts to eliminate the tribal leaders who may be willing to work with Baghdad or willing to work with outside forces against Daesh, how, how are we gonna create a division between them and Daesh and them and ISIS in order to create a new real unity government in Iraq? Simple questions. Simple questions. Um, um, let me start with Mohammed's question. Um, I'll give you an example during the election, before the um, election. If one followed the um, election debate in Basra, um, in, um, or rough, let, let me put it this way. If one followed the election debate among the Shia parties uh, who were competing for the same constituency, among the Sunni parties who are competing for the same constituency, among the Kurds, one would think these are three different elections. Um, in the South, most of it was exactly about that. It was about corruption, about poverty, about um, security to a certain extent, but not in the sense of the security of uh, uh, um, the threat of a, of a car bomb, but the security of our community in the country as a whole. Um, and to a certain extent, one, one, one may, if you look just at that debate, you would say, why isn't anyone talking about Daesh or about the, the, the Anbar and about the provinces? Or they're talking about them in sort of a bit of a detached way. Um, within the Sunni community, it was all about, um, I'm not sure what it was actually about. It was about uh, different political leaders fighting for power among each other. Uh, but roughly speaking, you had those who sort of accept the political process and those who don't accept the political process and about marginalization and these issues. Um, and with the Kurds, uh, it was mostly you know, clearer because of the family structures that control the uh, political entities there. Um, so 
Um, what I've always tried to uh, argue um, within the UN, um, and I know it doesn't make our, our work easier, but if you want to talk about national reconciliation, if you want to talk about Sunni inclusion, all of these issues that everyone loves talking about, you cannot deal with those issues unless you deal with the issues in the South. Because if anyone tries to deal with those issues without dealing with the issues in the South, they will lose their political constituency. And at the end of the day, Iraq is not an emirate. It is, it is a democratic you know, political process. So uh, for, for, for Prime Minister Abadi to move forward on the reconciliation agenda, um, he needs to, be, to show that he's also delivering in the South, exactly on issues like corruption, um, um, uh, poverty, um, perhaps are the two biggest, actually. Corruption and poverty are the two biggest. Uh, and decentralization. Um, uh, not sort of the full federalism, but devolving some authority and power to the, uh, to the provinces. Um, um, and it is my understanding, and this is what at least we've seen from, from the government, that this is the approach that this administration is now taking. Let's resolve the problems with the Kurds. The deal on oil, it has, now it has a different set of challenges, but at least there's a deal to you know, quiet that bit of the equation, address problems in the South, address problems in the West. Um, and um, it, it, this is why we always keep going back to the issue of balance. Unless you have a balanced approach, you're going to lose one of the three. It's like you have to keep three balls, at least three balls, because and then you have the minorities but at least three balls up in the air at, uh, uh, at all time. Um, and this is what we've tried to uh, advocate again with um, um, the international community at large and with, uh, uh, with uh, other countries that you know, do not, do not um, disregard the importance of what is happening in the south um, of, of Iraq, because that is driving the political uh, debate. And again, I mean, I keep going back to poverty. I understand corruption is very, very important. It is really um, a terrible problem for Iraq. But, but to have a country that is as rich in oil as Iraq, to have one city like Basra, which has more oil than the, United, the entire United Arab Emirates, and to have such pervasive and deep poverty um, is completely unacceptable. And you cannot, unless you resolve that, you cannot resolve anything else. We did a study um, uh, before the fall of Ramadi, not related to the fall of Ramadi, which proved quite clearly that, that, that um, um, what are they called, the Millennium Indicators, um, the, the millennium, millennium Development um, um, Indicators in, in, in Basra were worse than in Ramadi. Uh, people in Ramadi had better access to uh, healthcare and infrastructure, etc., than in, in the south, in the richest city of the Gulf. Um, um, so anyone who disregards this balance will lose the equation and will not be able to deliver on anything on political reconciliation or anything else. I think the government's actually making good progress uh, on national reconciliation. Uh, to my liking, it's a little bit too slow, uh, but then I also always temper myself by saying, look, you know, until a few months ago, everybody was accusing the previous prime minister that he uh, hadn't approved um, uh, the bylaws of the Council of Ministers. So he would not have a vote among the ministers and laws, but he would take decision and, and that's it. Um, this prime minister, the first thing he did was uh, put the bylaws in. Now, obviously, that makes decision making slower. Um, so, you know, let's not complain about things that we wanted the government to do and now complain that they've done it. So it's, it is slow. Um, uh, it could be uh, quicker, I'm sure, uh, but there are these constraints um, um, that exist. Um, uh, Warren's question on uh, depend, uh, dependence on the Syrian um, situation. Uh, it is very dependent on Syria. I mean, let's not, uh, let's not forget that. Um, Daesh is a product of Syria, of the situation in Syria at the very least. Um, and uh, this is uh, the source of, you know, its basis before it sort of came into, uh, came into um, um, Iraq. 
But it is not just that. It is when you have um, uh, the crisis in Syria, which puts, uh, which also has a sectarian um, element to it. Um, when you have that crisis, um, you also become that crisis becomes a magnet for people from Iraq. So you have Iraqis fighting on all sides of the Syrian conflict as well, um, and uh, that creates that link which makes the two uh, the two uh, conflicts uh, so um, connected. However. Um, Iraq is not Syria, um, and um, one day, inshallah, when the ISIL issue is resolved, one of the best things that Iraq can do for its future is to build a very long fence on the border with Syria um, um, and protect that uh, border very, very carefully. Um, because I think that uh, one needs to be very uh, mindful uh, I mean, obviously, that's you know me sort of joking about it, but one needs to be very mindful about the links that exist between uh, um, the, the the two countries that can threaten the security of both um, uh, both countries. Um, Iraq is not Syria, and the resolving Iraq and resolving the situation in Syria needs two completely different approaches, uh, because if one uh, wants to uh, approach both with the same toolbox, um, we will lose Iraq. Um, Iraq has a democratic constitution, it has political entities, it has a, a vibrant media environment, it has um, um, you know, uh, a completely different set of uh, uh, tools that you need than, um, uh, than Syria. Um, and uh, Syria is very, very far from that from that uh, stage. Um, and in a way, if you, want, if you wish, I don't think you can, at the end of the day, resolve the Syrian conflict without, um, so, so, without stabilizing Iraq. Uh, and we have a better chance right now of stabilizing the situation in Iraq and making sure that there's progress on inclusivity, on fighting dash, etc. Uh, um, than, than the situation in Syria. And I say this with great sadness because uh, as a child I lived in Syria and I feel very um, very sad about what's, what's, what's happening there. Um, Iran um, does uh, work very closely both with the regime in um, Damascus and with the government um, um, in Iraq. Um, and it um, has different, I think, from my experience of visiting Iran and talking to, to, to effectively everyone there, um, there are different views in Iran as to the situation in Iraq. Uh, one view says um, the policy of the previous government has failed, therefore this new government needs to be given a chance to create a balance between the communities and an environment which is um, um, conducive for stability and we, therefore we need to support the government. Um, um, of course, that is uh, caveated with the need to protect the Shia uh, south of the country from the risk of, um, um, of uh, Daesh. Um, and then there's a second trend uh, which says that uh, you, know, uh, you have a government in Damascus and you have a government in Baghdad. They need to be supported and anyone in between them who disagrees with both of these governments is a terrorist and therefore they need to be killed. Um, and that is a very simplified and very dangerous um, approach. Um, and I'm, I'm very happy that I think uh, what has been happening over the last few months is that the first um, analysis seems to be prevailing uh, rather than the second analysis. Now how long that will last and how um, contingent that is on other dossiers that uh, are important for, uh, for the Iranians um, is a very uh, complicated um, uh, debate. Um, on um, Adam's question of um, um, central centralization and um, uh, how do we bring people back in, well, I think that you know clearly what um, political leaders who, as you said, aptly still play a role in Iraq, um, uh, political leaders who believe that centralizing power is the answer, um, um, they are on the way out. And they can make a lot of noise, 
um, and they can certainly cause trouble. Uh, but the consensus within the society has moved in a different direction. Um, and that is quite evident from what we hear from both Shia uh, political parties, the Islamic Council, the Sadrists, others, and what we hear also from the, uh, from the Sunni um, camp, so to speak. So there isn't that appetite for centralizing as it was before. Um, that doesn't mean that there's an appetite for federalizing. Because federalism will, in Iraq, always be a very controversial issue, not just in Iraq, but also in the context of the region. But what there is is a very reasonable understanding uh, that you need to devolve power to the provinces um, without undermining the unity um, um, of, of the country. And that's one, one answer um, to that um, uh, uh, question. Um, how do we get people out of Daesh areas? Um, certainly not just by talking to them. Um, and you know the, the drinking chai sessions are lovely and we've all engaged in with them many, many times. Um, and they sort of have a repetitive pattern to them. Um, but the, the People need to see that they have a future with Iraq. I mean, like, unless the people, the people see that they have a future with, um, uh, with Baghdad, uh, you can't cajole them into uh, joining the, uh, the process. So what um, I think the, the, the political logic should be you have um, 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 whatever happened in the past happened, but if you accept the political process, if you accept the constitution, um, if you accept to put your arms away, your weapons away, and I don't know, join the National Guard or something like that, there, there is a way for you to come back into normality. Um, and on top of that, you have all of these, you know, the superstructure, the, the, the political initiatives, the laws, the inclusion, all of it. That's the only way that you can sort of bring them out. Um, um, otherwise, they will probably say, um, yes, thank you very much. Uh, we will fight Dash. Um, as long as you pay us. Um, and uh, once you stop paying, um, then you know, these people are left on their own. Many of them today do not want to do that. They, they, they openly say to us, we do not want to go down the Sahwa road from the past. We don't want to, to, to be that. We want to have the National uh, Guard so that we can be secure that we have received recognition from our state, that our salaries, our pensions, our health care is taken care of, et cetera, et cetera. Then. Really, thank you very, very much for all these insights. This has been absolutely terrific, very valuable. You could see from the questions, and, and um, I'm sure that there would be many more questions, but unfortunately, we really have to wrap up. But not without wishing you very well for the rest of this mandate, very well for your next mandate. And we're terribly sorry that Fletcher didn't have you here as a student, so you're always welcome to come well, back. Thank you very, very much for this thank opportunity. You.